All right, I think we've had a, a very stimulating morning uh, uh, with some continuity between the panels, but certainly a continuous discussion through the panels. Uh, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, one of my former bosses, actually a boss in many different respects, Rudy DeLeon, uh, who I worked with as a colleague in the House Armed Services Committee and worked uh, under his supervision, uh, so to speak, uh, at the House Armed Services Committees as well, uh, although I think he sometimes wonder how much supervision I really took during that time, uh, but then worked with him closely when we came over at the beginning of the Clinton administration, both in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and in the Department of the Air Force. Uh, Rudy is somebody I've learned a great deal from, and I'm very thankful that he's agreed to come here, participate later in the afternoon, introduce Secretary Cohen. Rudy DeLeon. Well, thank you, Clark Murdoch, and thank you. You know, I just look out at the tables and I see a luminary at every table. I had the chance to visit with Harlan Ullman, and I see the former titan of journalism, Mr. Pat Towell of the old Congressional Quarterly, now of the Congressional Research Service in his years of covering the Armed Services Committees in the 80s uh, and 90s. So, um, and Paul Gebhardt, uh, one of the principals at the Cohen Group. So, uh, and Ray Dubois from uh, CSIS. So anyway, uh, Clark, you've assembled a great, great group. My pleasure to introduce Secretary Cohen as the keynote speaker, uh, the chairman and CEO of the, the Cohen Group, which uh, is one of the formidable uh, groups in Washington in terms of uh, knowledge and capabilities of global trends and global cap capabilities. Um, also, the Secretary of Defense during a very challenging time, but equally important, uh, a member of both branches of Article I, the House of Representatives and then the United States Senate, in particular the Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, the topic, obviously, is strategy for the future as we deal with a huge budget and confidence crisis in the United States. It's also just catching the end of the earlier panel and all of the discussion on, on strategy f for many of us, because in many respects, my experiences uh, parallel uh, Secretary Cohen's. He was at the principal level. I was there at the staff level trying to get Clark Murdoch to get his papers in. Uh, <laughs> learning how to manage PhDs is a knack. Um, but, you know, the challenge of the 80s after the Reagan buildup was to figure out how we were going to move from an era of debt to one where we could invest again. And so from that period of 1987 to 1998, whether you were on the Armed Services Committee or serving in the Pentagon, managing the resources as well as the missions, the strategies, and the global responsibilities was at, at the, the heart of, of those duties. And it's interesting, given that it took a decade and a half to reach that point where the budget could be balanced, and that then Secretary Cohen sent several of the senior staff over to start negotiating with OMB and the White House in terms of how we were going to actually start spending on defense again, resulting in uh, the top line starting to go up uh, from fiscal 99 and on. Um, but all of these pieces together, but the decade and a half that it took to get to those budget increases of Graham Rudman, uh, the Bush Gebhardt, Dick Gebhardt, not Paul Gebhardt, uh, agreement in 1990, uh, the deficit reduction package in 93, and then the big package uh, between President Clinton and uh, Senator Dole. Uh, after the government shutdown in 95, that really led us by 98, and then along with a phenomenal decade of, of economic growth. So against all of those challenges, you know, the Department of Defense left uh, to its successors a budget imbalance and a capable force um, that was ready to respond to the challenges of 9-11 of and to the first decade of the 21st century. So he's as current as the latest uh, headline and the latest flashpoint, and I know he's going to have many interesting perspectives, both in terms of the crisis around the world, 
but equally important, the crisis of confidence that's here in Washington, D.C. right now. So um, Secretary of Defense, Senator, uh, Mayor, uh, CEO of the Cohen Group, uh, Bill Cohen. Well, you could tell by Rudy's introduction that uh, he's a master of budgets. Uh, he um, really underplayed his role at the Pentagon um, because he was uh, in charge of crunching numbers, uh, certainly, and then became uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, who essentially ran everything while I took all the credit for it. So, uh, Rudy, you should be up here talking uh, and not me. Uh, I was intrigued with the uh, subject of matter, uh, defense in the age of austerity. There have been so many ages that I have passed through. Um, there was uh, Alan Greenspan's uh, Age of Turbulence. Um, there was uh, Joshua Cooper Ramos's uh, book, The Age of uh, the Unthinkable. Uh, for me, I go back to uh, The Age of Future Shock. Uh, that was really the first book that caught my attention way back in the early 70s uh, when Toffler uh, started talking about this hurricane wind of change that was going to be blowing through uh, the world. And it seemed unlikely at that point, but it has become a reality as we've seen how time has actually been accelerated and speeded up by, by events. Uh, Paul Gephardt uh, is in the, the room today, and he and Rudy both know. I used to keep beside my desk two quotes. I'm going to read them to you because uh, they are still relevant to me. The first quote uh, was, um, our earth is degenerate in these latter days. Bribery and corruption are common. Children no longer obey their parents. Every man wants to write a book. Actually. And the end of the world is evidently approaching. And uh, I'd, I'd like to say it has a contemporary ring to it, but it was on an Assyrian tablet some 4,700 years ago. Um, next quote uh, that I kept beside me was uh, this one. It is a gloomy moment in the history of our country. Not in the lifetime of most men has there been such grave and deep apprehension. Never has the future seemed so uncertain as it does at this time. The domestic situation is in chaos. Our dollar is weak throughout the world. Prices are so high as to be utterly impossible. The political cauldron sees and bubbles with uncertainty. Russia hangs as usual like a cloud, dark and silent upon the horizon. It's a solemn moment of our troubles and no man can see the end. Uh, could be in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Times, uh, any contemporary publication. It was written in Harper's Weekly in 1897. So I used to keep those by my desk just to try to put some perspective uh, on uh, uh, things that have happened in the past, the anxieties, apprehensions uh, of our uh, forebears, and uh, how we managed to, uh, to get through it all. There's something, uh, even though I try to keep that in perspective, something different today. Uh, Rudy touched upon it in terms of, I would say, the three Ds. Uh, you have um, deficits uh, running roughly 1.4 trillion uh, on an annual basis. You have a debt that's 14 trillion. And I think you have dangers that we uh, have not seen before in terms of their uh, complexity and unpredictability. Uh, in fact, uh, when Rudy talks about crisis of confidence, I think we're suffering from a lack of confidence that we have the ability to manage uh, the forces that tend to surface like a tsunami unannounced. And then they, uh, they sweep and overwhelm uh, all of our plans and, and assumptions. A quote that I have always kept near and dear to me as well has been that of uh, John Kennedy because uh, he really was the individual who inspired me when I was a young law school a student. And I was thinking about his quote as well uh, and how it applies today. Let every nation know whether it bear us Ill, well or ill, that we'll pay any price, bear any burden, endure any hardship, um, defend any friend, oppose any foe in order to ensure the survival and success of liberty. I wonder, could any political leader make that statement today? Is there any presidential candidate that could say we'll pay any price, bear any burden in order to ensure the success of uh, liberty and, and freedom? So we're living in a time of uh, constraint, uh, as you've called it, austerity. Uh, and the question is, how do we function? What do we do? What's our role? And it's interesting, you're all the experts uh, in the, uh, the audience, and it's kind of difficult for me to be uh, talking to you about what needs to be done. But if you think about it, you can't talk about how to deal with a budget until so you decide um, what it is you want to do. Um, what is our role in the world today? What are our responsibilities in this world that is one of turbulence, uncertainty, age of unthinkability, uh, age of, um, of austerity? 
What's our role? And we have to decide that. Uh, Kennedy said, any, we'll go anywhere, do anything. And now we're saying, uh, different voices saying, um, come home, America. Uh, it's not George McGovern, 1972, come home, America. This is uh, Ron Paul, uh, 2011, come home, America. President Barack Obama saying it's time for the United States to start nation building at home. So we have this notion it's time to come back and deal with problems here. It was interesting because I came from a lecture this morning or a speech this morning by one of our colleagues in the Cohen Group, uh, Lord George Robertson. And he was giving kind of an overview of how he thing, sees things uh, in Europe. And he said what's taking place there is rather fascinating because it's the, uh, the renationalization of issues that have no national solution. Something similar taking place in this country, but we're talking about going back to states' rights for which no state is able to solve the issues. And so there are interesting dynamics underway of talk about the renationalization of issues when in fact there is no nation that can deal with the kind of problems that are likely to confront us. And so we have to decide under these circumstances, who are we? Uh, what is our role? Uh, when I was at the Pentagon, Rudy was there as well, Paul Gephardt, uh, Amos Goodman comes later in uh, the Cohen Group in Life. But there was a book written by Richard Haas and it was called The Reluctant Sheriff. And that's pretty much how I saw our role in the world. Be a reluctant sheriff. Uh, have the best military you can, but uh, really choose wisely before you decide to deploy them anywhere. And uh, Pat, you may recall how reluctant I was to get engaged uh, in the Kosovo campaign. I said, over to you, Europe. It's your problem, not ours. And the Europeans came back and said, we can't go without you. You need to lead this particular effort. But I was reluctant. I wanted to be that reluctant sheriff, and we could afford to be at that time. Uh, the, uh, the Berlin Wall was down. Uh, the Soviet Empire no longer existed. Uh, life was a little bit more uh, was simpler then, so we could be more reluctant. Then came 9-11, and you have a new president. You have a new um, theory, a new doctrine, uh, that of uh, preemption. And so you go from being a reluctant sheriff to almost the Texas Terminator, right? Uh, and uh, that had its consequences, politically speaking, because a lot of countries resented the fact that we were a little bit too big and too, uh, too boastful and too aggressive and too unilateral. So we learned some of the limitations of the exercise of power uh, at that point. Now the question is, who are we today? And it's almost, are we a member of an international posse? Uh, sometimes taking the leadership of that posse, in, Li in Libya, by way of example, and then saying over to you, uh, members of NATO, and we'll lead from behind. Is that something that the United States is going to do on a more regular basis in the future? What is it we see our role as being uh, in a world uh, in which there is greater and greater turbulence uh, and, um, and, and forces of uh, disintegration in some cases? The point is that we can't walk away from the world there are those who say, come home, America, whoever is saying it. We can't walk away from the world because the world's not going to walk away from us. That's simple. We can't retreat to a continental cocoon and think we can watch the world unfold on CNN and think we're safe. So we have to be engaged. That's a word we like to invoke. We have to be engaged. Um, uh, Amos, you came up with a nice quote for me uh, today. Uh, uh, I think it's a uh, ubiquite. Uh, and uh, tango. We like, we like Latin phrases in Maine. Uh, Derigo, I lead, is the <laughs> state motto. This one is, I touch everywhere. Uh, and we had that philosophy as well. Um, and we want to be forward deployed. Moody will tell you we had three mantras at the Pentagon. Shape, respond, prepare. Shaping was critical. We tried to be forward deployed in as many places as we could in order to try and shape events in ways that would be advantageous to the United States. Having a presence is really important. And when you pull that presence away, uh, some bad things can happen. On a domestic level, think about it, because one of the recommendations is going to be to consolidate bases. That's one thing we can do. We've got 10, 15 percent overhead out there that we still can consolidate more bases. There's a, an efficiency aspect of that. There's a money-saving aspect of that. Uh, but there are political consequences that go with that. I happen to have represented the state of Maine, and I saw Dow Air Force Base leave Bangor. 
uh, and uh, we had Loring Air Force Base up in uh, northern Maine. What happens when you have the uniform military that departs from your community, and they are very valuable members of that community. They attend the Lions Club, the Rotar Rotarian Clubs, etc. They are part of the community. And when you remove them, guess what happens? The public doesn't see them. The public thinks of other issues. They no longer think about defense. How many times have you heard any debate take place in Iowa uh, on the size of the defense budget? Not many, because it's not an issue for them. And so uh, there are political consequences to shrinking back, pulling back, consolidating. You can do it for efficiency, but you have to then think about what are the consequences. And we have to think about this as well, as we look for ways to live in this age of austerity and look at the choices we have to make, uh, understand that there are consequences. I could go on and tell you, for example, uh, Secretary Gates was in Singapore in um, June of this year, just as he was in June of the previous year. Interesting, uh, if you were to look at the coverage back in June uh, 2010 and June 2011. June 2010, he was uh, publicly decrying what had taken place. The Chinese had canceled uh, his visit as a protest of the arms sales of Taiwan. Uh, very kind of acrimonious uh, sentiment at that time between the Chinese and the United States. Uh, he was there this year in June, and uh, we were making uh, very positive overtures to the Chinese who were also there at that conference. Uh, but the whole notion was at that time uh, that we want to be engaged in ASEAN, in the um, Asia-Pacific region. And Secretary Gates said to the skeptics in the audience, he said, I will predict to you that five years from now we'll be even more heavily engaged throughout the Asia-Pacific region. To a number of skeptics in the audience saying, hmm, interesting. Let's take a look at your budget and tell me how you're going to accomplish more engagement in the ASEAN countries, now, and, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. But I think as we look at this and we say, well, how do we do all of this? And the QDR has always been important. Uh, we try to look into the future and say, what, uh, what are the threats out there? And if we can see these threats, uh, how do we shape our forces? What is the force structure? What are the end strengths? What, are we, what is it we need in terms of equipment to deal with these threats that are coming at us? those that we can identify and those that we have to try and anticipate to make sure that there are not too many black swans uh, out there that are coming at us that uh, we haven't uh, foreseen. We've got a roles and missions study underway. Uh, that will be important as the magnificent 12 up on the hill, uh, the special uh, select committee has to decide how they're going to allocate uh, these uh, reductions. If we look at the Middle East, again, the world has changed rather dramatically. We had one uh, individual set himself on fire and it lit a fire that had spread throughout much of the Middle East. The Middle East is gonna be different from now on. We're not going to have uh, as friendly uh, and close a relationship, I suspect, with Egypt as we had in the past. Uh, the same is true perhaps for some of the other uh, countries in the region. The world has changing over there rather dramatically. What does that mean for us? Uh, what does it mean in terms of the stability of the region? Um, if we look at Iraq, okay, we can say there's no Saddam, um, but uh, as yet there's no democracy that is truly stable and secure. So we still got instability in Iraq. Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda is on the run, but they're still out there and they're, they're, out, they're out there uh, and on the run as long as we're there. We have some 80,000 troops uh, that are committed to Afghanistan for at least, according to the President's timetable, 2014. So, yeah, things are okay as long we're there, as we're there, but that may change. Pakistan is a democracy that is fragile, increasingly under assault from within. And then there is Iran, which has, uh, is on its way to a, a nuclear capability, and what does that mean in terms of stability in the region? So. That's a region that we have to focus on, saying, well, what, are, what will be our access uh, to the region, both uh, from a military point of view? Uh, will we still continue to have uh, major exercises uh, each, well, every other year uh, in the, uh, with Egypt and others? Uh, will we have access uh, that we've had in the past, political access as well? So we have to take into account that the world has changed in the Middle East. One of the biggest changes, of course, is China. And China has emerged. I can tell you I started going to China back in 1978. And at the time I went there, they had one hotel and they had no cars. 
so you're looking at a dramatic, uh, probably the most dramatic uh, transformation of a society in the shortest period of time in the history of mankind. Uh, and at that time, I met with Deng Xiaoping, and he talked about his four modernization programs, and he put uh, military last. He said, we'll get to that last. Well, last is now here. Uh, and so uh, they um, are feeling much more confident about their role in the world. Uh, many feel that uh, the 21st century uh, will be theirs and that the, uh, they are on the ascent and the United States are on the decline. Uh, and so that's an, uh, a, uh, an issue which we can contest in terms of the reality of it, but it's something in terms of a growing sense of national pride, nationalism. Uh, and a growing military capability to match their economic uh, uh, power. So it's going to present some challenges, as we now know that the Chinese have indicated the South China Sea is theirs. It's their exclusive jurisdiction, and we are not to intervene in any way. So now you have the great irony. And Vietnam has called upon the United States to help out resolve the issue with the Chinese. And the Chinese have said, thanks very much, but stay out of it. It's none of your business. So we have an issue in which China is likely to develop. They have uh, demonstrated stealth technology. You recall that Secretary Gates made his visit. It was uh, purely co coincidental, I'm sure, that they, uh, they hauled out their, their latest or their, their only version of a uh, stealth uh, fighter. But it's coming. It's coming. They'll have stealth technology. They, they have acquired a, an aircraft carrier, not capable as, as ours to be sure, but it is symbolically very important for the region uh, to say that they're going to develop a power projection capability. Uh, and uh, just that one aircraft carrier alone tells the, the rest of the, uh, the world in that region uh, that they're going to be a, an econo a military power as well as an economic power. And I'll come back to ASEAN, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, I was there with uh, Secretary Gates and conducting a series of meetings. Uh, I, along with Hank Greenberg, are co-chairing a study that has been commissioned by CSIS is to talk about the relationship between the United States uh, and the ASEAN countries. And to put it uh, shorthand, uh, all of the ASEAN countries are doing an enormous amount of business, tremendous trade uh, with, with China, and that is likely to increase. I think it's fair to say there's also enormous apprehension on the part of all of the ASEAN countries that China is going to dominate uh, the region. And they would like the United States uh, to basically be a security blanket. Basically say that, you know, we, we need you. We need you to be engaged. We want you to be engaged not by establishing bases, uh, perhaps by paying more port visits, but having a stronger uh, relationship across the board, not simply military but diplomatic, economic, culturally, they want us engaged. Not to the point that we annoy or agitate the Chinese, but that's a strict, a pretty tight balance that we've got to maintain. Uh, and it's a hard argument to make to Capitol Hill saying, you know, we're going to commit resources to a region, uh, but we can't really be too aggressive uh, because that will be contrary to their interests and ultimately to ours. So a lot of diplomacy is going to go into this effort because the Chinese are rightfully going to say we're an economic power, we're entitled to have a military to protect it, uh, and we're going to do so. Uh, and so we have to take that dynamic into account. I pass over Russia. Um, uh, Russia, uh, we're likely to see the, re we know we're going to see the reemergence of uh, President Putin. Um, uh, we tried to recalibrate uh, and restart this relationship with, uh, with Russia um, through the Obama administration. And perhaps uh, it will improve, but I think that uh, they are unlikely to be a close ally or friend of the United States in the uh, immediate future. But there are issues that we can work with the Russians on, we'll have to work with the Russians on. And I think that President Putin is going to continue to insist that he is going to be, and Russia is going to be, a player on the geostrategic uh, landscape. So what is the world looking like then? Middle East, a lot of change. ASEAN, the whole Pacific uh, uh, area, uh, China is likely to be a, a major player. And so we have to be concerned about what Joe Nye wrote about. Remember, Joe Nye wrote the book, The Paradox of American Power? Namely, that when one country uh, displays uh, or exercises power, 
uh, to a point where even your friends or your allies will align themselves in ways that will restrict the exercise of that power. Um, the Chinese have, have to face that as well. They are becoming more powerful, but they've got to be careful they don't show that power uh, too much or too eagerly. Now, I'll give you an example of that. You recall when the Japanese had uh, arrested the captain of a fishing trawler that had rammed one of their boats? Uh, I happened to be over in Tokyo during this time, and the Chinese demanded his release, and the Japanese said no. And the Chinese said, we're asking you again. They said no. And then finally, there was somehow a shortage of rare earth minerals being shipped uh, to Japan. And the Japanese said, here's your man. Now, that was a very embarrassing moment, embarrassing for the Japanese. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, it certainly sent the signal to the Japanese and to others who were watching that um, perhaps this exercise of raw power by the Chinese uh, concentrated the minds of others, saying maybe we shouldn't be so dependent upon China for rare earth minerals. So now you have Australia uh, doing their own uh, uh, mining for rare earth minerals. You have other studies underway. So there's also this paradox of power. The Chinese have to be uh, careful that they uh, don't display a power to the point where it causes uh, many others to align themselves in ways to constrain that exercise of power. I mentioned all of this uh, simply, um, I passed over cyber warfare, uh, which may be the biggest threat of all uh, that we have to confront. And that reminded me of Woody Allen's speech to the graduating class where he said, uh, uh, America is at a, uh, a crossroads, critical time in our uh, history. Uh, one path we face, um, uh, utter um, despair and frustration. Uh, and uh, on, the other hand, on the other path, uh, we face total extinction. Um, may you choose widely, wisely, graduates. And, and sometimes we feel that way, except that we have to remind ourselves that we still are a great power. There is, if you, uh, I like to uh, do what Mort Saul used to do, rip and read from the, uh, the papers. Uh, pick up the article that uh, David Ignatius had on today's, in, in today's uh, Washington Post dealing with Mike Mullen, Admiral Mullen, uh, pointing out that uh, we have the finest, uh, the most combat-hardened um, military, the most efficient military, uh, all-volunteer force in the world, and we do. Uh, we still have a $700 billion budget. It's going to decline somewhat. We have had 13, Paul, like, correct me, 13 years, successive years of, uh, of real increase in growth in the military budget. And yes, we're going to, and we still have the enormous support of the American people. So we're going through some harder times right now, but the real issue is, is one of what Rudy talked about, uh, is uh, it's political. It's a question of confidence. It's a question of leadership. And I think the danger is for us uh, is that we will do what we have done in the past. We will cut uh, research, development, training, education. Uh, we'll cut modernization. Uh, we'll fail to invest in the future. Uh, and we will continue to spend more on personnel to the point where we start to hollow out the force. And that's one of the greatest dangers that we face. We can have a smaller force. We're going to have to have a smaller force. We can't do more with less. We can't do as much with less. And the question is, can we do uh, less with less? And the answer is we'll have to. So we can construct a force that is still very powerful, very efficient, uh, very expeditionary, uh, and not hollow. Secretary Panetta has said he will, not, uh, he will not reign over a hollow military. But these are the forces at work in terms of what will take place uh, up on Capitol Hill unless we act uh, with, with some wisdom here. There are tough choices, but they can be wise ones. I mentioned BRAC. That's a likely uh, area of uh, consolidation, which will have saved considerable money. It's been talked about in terms of retirement benefits, uh, to reform the system, uh, to make it uh, a bit more equitable in terms of commitment uh, and, um, and job description, health care, when I was at the Pentagon, the health care bill was $19 billion. Uh, it's scheduled in three years to be $60 billion on an annual basis. So health care is going to have to change somewhat in terms of co-pays, which have not been uh, increased since 1995, uh, and to privatize that which is not, not core to the operations. So those are things, they're, they're third rails. 
uh, as we like to talk about third rails, but as compared to what? Are you going to start again, uh, cut the budget in terms of RDT and E? Are you going to start hollowing out the force? Are you going to stretch out programs to the point where you get fewer at higher cost? So there are ways to go about um, uh, cutting uh, the defense budget, and we will have to. I know there are some in, uh, in uh, the town say you can't have a constrained defense budget. Well, we've got a $14 trillion uh, deficit, uh, debt rather, and uh, $1.4 trillion on an annual basis uh, in terms of, um, of deficit. And a f uh, force structure under the circumstance is just not sustainable. Uh, let me uh, just conclude with an uh, observation made by a 13th century Turkish poet. Uh, his name was Yusuf, and he said, uh, to keep the realm requires many men on horse and foot. To keep many men requires the people to have money. For the people to have money, it requires them to be rich. And for the people to be rich, the laws must be just. If any one of those four pillars is undone, then all are undone. And that's what we have to continue to think about. We have to have a strong military. In order to do that, we need money. In order to have money, we must generate prosperity. In order to generate prosperity, the people must feel that they are being treated justly, fairly. And if there is any gap between that sense that they are bearing burdens which are inequitable, unfair, and fundamentally unsound, then that support for each of those pillars will come undone. Uh, I'll conclude on that happy note uh, because I think it's important that as the members of Capitol Hill look at the budget, make decisions, don't do it in, a easy, in an easy fashion to say, let's just cut. Everybody take a percentage. That's not the way to deal with our national security. We can do it systematically, analytically, taking into account roles and missions. What are the threats? What are the, like, the most likely threats? Keeping in mind long-term threats are out there. China, Russia, others may become peer competitors uh, and either hostile or, or friendly, but competitors at the very least. Uh, how do we hedge against that? How do we do so in a way that still maintains a stable relationship with uh, either country or others who may emerge uh, as we deal with the short-term uh, types of threats that uh, Secretary Gates and now Secretary Pena are going to have to confront? Let me stop here. I was told that you excuse me, had some questions. I'll try to give you some answers. Thanks very much. Time for a few questions. Pat. I refuse to answer that uh, question on the grounds that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's very good to see you. Uh, let's go to those, those third rails. You presented them sort of like Woody Allen's dilemmas. You know, we can do something about retirement or hollow out the force and then choose wisely. Is the, you know. Now, You've been away from electoral politics longer than I've been away from journalism. That's hard to remember. Uh, but you played at a very high level very effectively for a long time. And I'd like, people don't think of politicians as being expert in anything but skilled agree, but they are. It's a real art, and, and you were a master of it, and, and still are. Is there some way, let's just take retirement and health care. Is there some way that either of those, you can construct a scenario that either of those could be approached in a constructive and, and practical way, sure. where you don't just you know, roll the dice and hope that people choose wisely. Yeah. Well, it really comes down to uh, easy word leadership. If you have leaders who are willing to go out and to talk uh, to the troops, and I'm talking about at all levels, not just dictating it, get the Joint Chiefs on board, let's go, uh, we can talk to uh, the Budget uh, Committee up on Capitol Hill, and we got OMB signing off. That won't do it, because the uh, the leaders in the military say, well, wait a minute, uh, that's a real disincentive. If we don't explain what we're doing, if we don't have buy-in uh, by the uh, people most directly affected, uh, some will choose to leave, but morale can turn very quickly. So making sure that you sustain morale is going to be critical to making sure you don't have that hollow force. And so I think it really depends upon um, leadership. Admiral Mullen uh, on the uh, don't ask, don't tell. 
He was very forthright, pointed out in uh, the Ignatius piece today. Didn't flinch, went straight ahead on it, but he said, let's take the year to go out and, and um, deal uh, with our troops in the field. Give us a year to see if we can make this work. And I think if you go out and you explain to our military, look, these are the choices that we face. Would you rather uh, pay a little more in terms of your premium if it means sustaining uh, our health care system for our military? If it means it's going to uh, put you and your family in a position, yeah, it'll cost you a little bit more, but just look at what, if you didn't have this, look what's going on in the private sector. So you can do that if you really engage them, if you really go down and work from the top level right to the, uh, to, uh, to the sergeants who are out in the field with them. That can be done, and I'm, I'm convinced that can be done. If you stay away from it, much as you can when you're dealing with Social Security, if you can't raise Social Security, um, I think you can. I think you can even start talking about uh, means testing these programs. I think we're getting to that point where we say, here are our choices, here's the dilemma. If we don't take this action, these are the consequences. And if you start talking to the American people and doing it on an educational basis, I think you'll find them uh, uh, willing. If you just want to throw red meat, you can do that. I mean, I, 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 I met, mentioned this uh, the other day, I said, when I, when I went uh, back to Maine to, uh, uh, to meet with my constituents, let's say farmers up in northern uh, Maine, some of my staff members, I had younger ones at that time who were with me, they said, why are you reciting T.S. Eliot? <laughs> and I said, look, I'm gonna give the same speech in northern Maine to my potato farmers that I'm gonna give to CSI down here in Washington. And what I found was people want you to lift them up, lift their spirits. Don't underestimate them. Don't talk down to them. Uh, don't think that all you have to do is throw uh, red meat to them on any given issue. If you uh, want to reason with them saying, here, look, here's my problem. Uh, uh, can you help me out? Here's a solution here. What do you think? So if you engage them at that level, I found it very successful for me over a 24-year uh, period of time. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was with a group yesterday talking about how do you get civility back into our political system. In the, all of the years I was in politics, I never once faced a negative campaign. Never once had an issue of incivility. Now, that was then, this is now. Life has changed 24 and 7 on cable shows, etc. But I think uh, we do a disservice to ourselves when we don't go to people and explain the hard choices they had to make and ask them to participate, to say, you know what made this country great? Uh, that we were willing to uh, share uh, the pain as well as the opportunity. There's a great quote from Walter Lippmann I used to use in some of my, uh, my commencement speeches. And uh, Lippmann went back to his uh, 30th reunion class of 1910 at Harvard. And he went uh, to his uh, former colleague, he said, you know something, every time we had a tough decision to make, we took the easy way out. He said, following World War I, what did we do? We cut our defense, we started passing the, uh, the bubbly around, enjoying life, and then what happened? We knew there was a mechanized evil over there in Europe, and we ignored it. And then we had to pay a price. He said, this is a standard to which the wise must now repair. You took the good things for granted, and now you must earn them again. For every right that you cherish, you have a duty you must perform. For every uh, good that you uh, wish to achieve, you have an obligation you must perform. Uh, and for every hope that you have, you must sacrifice your comfort and your ease because there's nothing but nothing any longer. Boy, those were tough words. They were true then, they're true now. And I think if you talk to people at that level, you'll get a response. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman, good to see you again. Um, and you. thanks for sharing your wisdom. Um, it seems to me that probably the largest problem collectively we face on the globe, whether in Afghanistan or Brussels or Washington, is bad or an absence of good governance, especially here. And you focused on that. I wonder if you could share some more of your wisdom as to how we might deal with this in the United States, because it seems to me that our biggest problem is failing governance, and I'm not sure one sees the leadership emerging at this stage that may be necessary. Boy, Tough, toughest question of all. I, I don't want to bore you with a senatorial answer to this. Um, but you know, it's discouraging to me when I see what is taking place up on Capitol Hill. Uh, when a president of the United States, and we can disagree with his policies and have philosophical uh, differences, 
But when the President of the United States offers you a deal, 80% of what you want, usually you take that and fight later for the other 20%. But to walk away from uh, something that say, no, under no circumstances, we get 100% or nothing at all, what I fear is taking place is we're having a parliament without a parliamentary system. Uh, and so you got, you know, you got those on the right over here and those on the left over here, and there's nobody in the middle because the, those in the middle get punished. Bob Bennett, one of the most conservative senators from Utah, gets booted out of the party because he did what? He talked about supporting TARP, or he talked about working across the aisle on immigration issues out of the party. You start looking what has taken place, the, 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 the punitive measures taken about anybody who wants to work across the aisle. Um, it's pretty, um, pretty dramatic and pretty, quite uh, a, a difference in the way life used to be. I mean, every, every, everybody looks back, you know, we're all looking back over our shoulder, all the good old days. But when I first went to the Senate, think about it, you had people like uh, Scoop Jackson, uh, you had Muskie, you had Abe Ribicoff, you had Jack Javits, you had Howard Baker, you had uh, Ted Kennedy, you had people who had real strong opinions. And they would fight like hell during the course of the, uh, the day. And they'd always end up finding a way to make it work. And right now, I don't see uh, a sentiment for wanting to make it work. We want to win the next election, and we're going to do practically nothing between now and next year. Because Republicans are going to do everything they can to prevent President Obama from having any successes. Well, what does that mean for all of us uh, in terms of we have to wait 13 months, 14 months? Before we say, well, okay, now we've got um, you know, Obama is either in or he's out. We've got new members of Congress. Now we have our supermajority, and then what? So then you'd have a, what, 40-member minority in the Senate on the Democratic side? 40 members can still do a lot of uh, blunting, stultifying, right? So what are we talking about in this kind of, why is it we are not rewarding people for being willing to take principal position if... You don't use the word compromise. You remember when Congressman Boehner, he was doing a, I think, a 60-minute uh, interview way in the beginning, and he said, uh, I will never compromise my principles. I always seek ways to develop a consensus, common ground. What happened? They've, they poll tested the word compromise. You use the word compromise, that means you're weak. That means you're unprincipled. So therefore, you can't use that word. All right, well, give me another formulation of that word. Um, and so I think what we've got to do is we've got to raise the level of, of, uh, an, of criticism against those individuals who walk away from something uh, that is both reasonable and fair and will deal with the issue. We should be willing. I think the president made a mistake, uh, frankly, on, um, on Bold Simpson. Uh, they came back after a commission, right? Commission makes recommendations. I didn't agree with everything there, but it was an approach uh, that could have been fleshed out, and the president gave it short shrift. Couldn't get a majority of members to sign on. It couldn't get the, the, uh, the 14, so it just went to the side. So where are we now? We've got 12 members who've been empowered to make these decisions. You've got six and six. Who's going to cross over? Which, which one's going to be brave enough to go with the other side to break the tie uh, at this point? And maybe they'll be able to come up with something because the Republicans said no taxes, no revenues under any circumstance, no matter uh, how fair they might be. Warren Buffett aside, no taxes. And the Democrats saying, don't touch Social Security, don't touch Medicare. They're both impossible positions if you're trying to find a way to really have a, a systematic uh, a solution here. And I think also we have to be aware that other people are watching us, not just us, the American people watching us. They're watching us overseas. Everything that we do, China, Russia, ASEAN countries, all of them, saying, what is the United States doing? Do they take us seriously anymore if we don't deal seriously with the issues? And so we've got uh, big problems, and I think what we have to do is to commend those people who are willing, at their own risk, political risk, to reach across and say, you know something, I don't like this, but I think it's necessary. I don't want to do this, I understand the impact, but I think it's necessary. And I think if we do that, I still believe that vast center out there that is growing increasingly angry. I was at this session yesterday in which the Pew uh, polls were 82% of those polls were angry, and they're all in the middle. Now, what does that mean? 
means that you're going to see possibly, and Tom Friedman has written about this, but this guy named Peter Ackerman. Peter Ackerman uh, has been f trying to find a way to circumvent the convention system. And he's going to do it through the internet. And he's going to go out and he's going to propose that you have a bipartisan ticket. If you have a Republican presidential nominee, it must be a VP, it must be a Democrat, and vice versa. Sounds implausible, impractical. He's going out on the internet to get a ticket on the ballot in every state so that you'll have the Republicans, the Democrats, and you'll have the other out there. And it could be any, it could be, it could be any of the candidates who are not going to make the final cut, and either party could end up on a ticket. Now, that may not work out this time, but that is out there, and people trying to find ways to resolve this uh, dilemma. I've always felt personally uh, that if a Democrat has a good idea, I want to I be with him. If Republicans have, I want to be with them. Uh, and I think we have to have more of that rather than taking ideological positions that are so absolute. You plant them in cement and say anybody who differs uh, and, and seeks compromise uh, is part of the mushy middle, unprincipled, when in fact you can maintain your principle of lower taxes, lower regulation, but recognize that under the, some circumstances, yeah, higher uh, income people can pay, pay a little more. Uh, under, uh, we, can, we can make changes in terms of retirement age for those who are white collar as opposed to those who are in the coal industry, et cetera. We, we can do those things if we have the political will. And what is missing right now is the political will to solve issues rather than simply structure and posture for the next campaign. So um, the crisis of confidence, I use that phrase uh, today. There was a book written about the recovery of confidence by John Gardner. Remember that book? A little thin book. He had said something, I have never forgotten it. He said the problem today, he said that our institutions have been caught in a savage crossfire between unloving critics and uncritical lovers. And what he meant by that, on one end of the extreme, you had the uh, unloving critics, people who only saw negativity in everything that we were doing and would uh, simply criticize with nothing uh, constructive uh, to support it, to supplant it. At the other end, you had these uncritical lovers, people who always embraced the status quo and would do everything they can to blunt and nullify any change. And what he was recommending is you've got to have critical lovers. You've got to have people who love our country and our system and, and, uh, and embrace it and also know that you've got to have change if it's going to be uh, viable and alive. Uh, if you have a still pond, you've got death and decay. You have a, a, a moving stream. You've got life and regeneration. And that's what we have to do to put back into our system. Anyway, I'm starting to sound like a senator, and I don't want to, I want to end on that. No, I think on that note, uh, great time. Please join me in thanking break if people could take their plates and put them in the back and the next panel could come up here and assemble and we'll get started in five minutes.